Chapter One. Captain McWhirr. Chapter One. Captain McWhirr. There's some bad weather out there. Captain McWhirr said to himself, looking at the barometer. He was a quiet man, who never looked for trouble. And rarely found it. When he talked, which was not often, he used few words. This made some people think that he was not so clever. He had blue eyes, not much hair on top of his head, with thin yellow hair around the back and sides, and thick red hair on his face. He had a strong, thick, short body. On shore, it didn't matter where, he always wore the same brown hat, brown suit, and heavy black boots. But everyone who worked with him knew that he was a good captain. Ships under his command arrived on time. And he never had trouble with his crews. When he was fifteen, McWhirr ran away from home in Ireland to be a sailor. He didn't tell his mother and father, who had a shop in Belfast, where he was, until eight months later, when he sent them a letter from Chile. Year after year, he worked on brunt ships, and didn't go home very often. But he wrote many letters home from all over the world. They were short, and always gave news about the weather. It's very hot here, or on Christmas Day, at four o'clock in the afternoon. It was very cold. In time, he met a young woman that he liked. Her name was Lucy. But he did not have time to write much about her to his mother and father, because they died. McWhirr married Lucy not long after he was given his first job. As the captain of a ship, the Nan Shan was three years old, and was made in Dumbarton, in Scotland. She was a fine, strong ship, neither too narrow nor too deep, and good in stormy weather. At first. The Nan Shan sailed under a British flag, but then the owner, Mister Sig, decided that it would be better to change to the old Thai flag. This was red, with a big white elephant in the middle of it. Jukes, the first mate, felt uncomfortable sailing under Thai colours. It looks strange to me, that flag with the elephant on it," he said to Captain McWhirr. "I don't like it." "There's nothing wrong with it," replied Captain McWhirr, looking up at the flag. "You just have to make sure that the crew put it the right way up." Jukes wasn't happy with the captain's answer. Later, down on deck, he told Solomon Rout about it. Rout, taking time out from the engine room, was the chief engineer. He was a tall, fatherly man, and often listened, smiling, to young Jukes's stories. I can't understand the captain," said Jukes. You say one thing to him, and he 
takes it another way. I was ready to leave my job because we're now sailing under that Thai flag. But all he could say was that you had to put it up the right way. And did you leave your job? Asked Rout, smiling. After many years' work on ships all over the world, Rout knew how important it was to have, and not to lose, a good job. No, I didn't, replied Jukes. He felt a little angry with himself, because he talked of it, but didn't do it. Rout, said the captain, arriving just then. Yes, sir, T replied. We're sailing for Fu Chow this afternoon. The engines must be ready in o'clock. And Jukes? Yes, sir? We're taking 200 Chinese laborers with us. They're arriving in about 20 minutes. During the day, they can stay on deck. And at night, they'll sleep in the hold. Make sure that there's room for them and their boxes. Yes, sir, said Jukes. And with that, the captain went to his room, and Rout and Jukes hurried away to do their work. The 200 Chinese workers were going back to their villages after seven years of work away from home. They all wore the same dark clothes, and each one carried a little box which was made of wood. In this box was everything that they had in the world and all their work money. Each one kept his box near him at all times. When they came on to the Nan Shan, Jukes told them where to go. Because the Chinese laborers couldn't speak English very well, he explained everything very loudly and slowly to them. You sleep here, you cook food here, and here you eat. In fine weather, you can come up, walk on deck, and enjoy the sea air. Did the Chinese workers understand him? Their tired faces didn't show what they were really thinking, so it was difficult to be sure. In four hours, the ship would leave for Fu Chao. There was just time to write to family and friends. McWhir, Rout, and Jukes all want to send letters before leaving. McWhir's letter was to his wife. Spending so much time at sea, Captain McWhir didn't understand his wife and their two children, Lydia and Tom, very well. He knew little about their lives and had little to tell them about his life. Lucy McWhir usually didn't read her husband's letters very carefully. They spoke about the we the sea, and other things that she didn't really find very interesting. Her one great worry was that one day he would come back and want to live at home with her all time. So does looking for any words about that. Remember me to the children, your loving husband, wrote McWhir, 
before he put his name at the bottom. Rat letters were much fuller, and his wife always enjoyed reading them. She lived with Rout's mother, who couldn't hear very well and needed help. And she often read the really interesting parts of her husband's letters very loudly to the old woman. I prefer a slow captain who does no wrong to a quick-thinking criminal one. They're easier to work with, wrote Rout to his wife, thinking of Macworth. Jukes always wrote a friend of his, a sailor on another ship, and he usually described everything that happened in his life and how he thought and felt about it. In this letter, he wrote... The other day, I was talking with one of the crew for a while, and later, the captain asked me, Was that you talking? I said, Yes. For two hours, he said. What do you find to talk about? When we're on shore, I see people talking all day. And then, in the evening, they go on talking over drinks. Surely they're saying the same things over again. I can't understand it. Isn't he a strange man? Sometimes he makes me angry. And sometimes I feel sorry for him. Because I think that he doesn't really understand anything of life at all. After the three writers finished and posted their letters, the Nan Shan was ready to go on her way. Chapter 2 Things Get Hotter Once the Nan Shan was out at sea, Captain McWhir looked at the barometer again. Yes, there's some really dirty weather out there, that's for sure, he said to himself. He was not worried by the way the weather was changing, and he didn't feel at all afraid at the idea of a typhoon. Spending most of his life at sea, he knew many different kinds of weather, and a typhoon was just another kind of bad weather for him. But perhaps Captain McWhir did not fully know the real power of the sea. Of course, he knew about typhoons, and he knew that they sometimes happened in the China Sea. Before becoming a captain, he read about typhoons in books, and he heard about them from other sailors. But to be in the middle of a very strong typhoon, in which the sea showed all its fury and its terrible power, no, this was something that McWhir himself did not really know. The swell getting stronger, and the ship started rolling slowly and heavily from side to side. It was now late afternoon, and the sun was beginning to go down. It was very hot, there was no wind at all, and McWhir could feel in the air. Perhaps everyone on the Nan Shan could feel it, because there was a heavy, angry feeling everywhere on the ship. Most of the Chinese laborers were on deck, spent 
in different ways. Some were looking out to sea, bored. Some were smoking. And some had their shirts off for pulling up buckets full of seawater from over the side of the ship to wash in because they were so hot. Three of them were pointing at one of their boxes, shouting. Perhaps they were really about, thought Macwur. The rest of them were sleeping quietly. Below deck, it was worse. The engine room was 117 degrees and the air was full of angry voices and the loud noise of metal on metal. The second, a big strong man called Harry, was shouting at his men because there was not enough steam. Harry often shouted and usually men worked quietly under him. But today, they were as angry he was. To make steam, they needed more air from the ventilators. And there was none. Harry came up on deck to see why this was and found Jukes. And give us enough steam if the ventilators aren't catching the wind, he shouted. The ventilators aren't the problem, said Jukes. There's no wind. That's the problem. Jukes knew that it was hard work in the engine room on a day like this. And so he decided it would be a good idea to let Harry shout for a while. Perhaps after that... He would go back down below deck and do his job more quietly. But the second engineer didn't listen to Jukes's words. Look, it's just like I thought. This ventilator's pointing in the wrong direction. I don't know what your men do all day. Do they just lie around on their fat backs? He tried to change the direction of the ventilator, but it was too heavy to move. Jukes stopped him. Harry, I told you before, there's nothing that we can do. There's no wind. But look, there's a storm coming. Harry looked at the strong swell of the sea around them and then at Jukes. This is a dog's life, he said angrily. And with that, he went back down to the engine room. Jukes turned round and saw MacWur looking at him. Why did you let him talk to you like that? The captain asked. You mustn't be soft with the crew. If he goes on like that, he'll have to find himself a new job on another ship very soon. His men can't make enough steam. And it's not easy working down there when it's so hot. I understand how he feels. Even up here, on deck, I feel like I have a blanket round my head. A blanket round your head? What do you mean? Have you ever had a blanket round your head, Jukes? What was that for? It's just a way of speaking, sir, said Jukes, thinking that Captain MacWur really had a very strange way of understanding things. Well, if there's any more talk of that kind from the second engineer, 
He'll have to go, said MacWhir, and he walked away. At eight o'clock, it was dark. Jukes went to the chart room to write the ship's log. As he did every day, he wrote the number of miles, the direction the ship was sailing in, and what kind of wind there was that day. Should he write down what he thought, or only what he could see? Under comments, he wrote, Terribly hot weather. And the swell is making the ship roll heavily. He thought for one or two minutes and then wrote, The Chinese laborers are all safely below deck for the night. The barometer is still going down. He was closing the log when the ship rolled very heavily. He looked out of the window. In front of his eyes, a great big dark wave climbed up higher and higher until it hid the starry sky. He wrote one more comment in the log. From what I can see, a typhoon is on its way. <laughs>